Good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. The portfolio on this occasion is education and skills. Uh, I'd invite any member wishing to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant questions. I think advise the Chamber there is quite a bit of interest in supplementaries, so again, the usual appeal for brevity in questions and responses. And I call question number one, Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the summit on tackling violence in schools. Cabinet Secretary. There are multiple strands to the Behaviour in Schools Summit. In June, I convened the first meeting of the Head Teacher Task Force, which focused on issues surrounding school exclusion. I chaired a summit focused on recording and monitoring incidents in schools on the 5th of September. This was an area of concern raised recently during parliamentary debate back in May. The next two events are currently scheduled for October and November. This approach enables engagement with a wide range of stakeholders so that we are hearing and learning from the broadest range of interests and experiences possible. It also allows exploration of the key issues in depth and for the work to be informed by evidence from the Behaviour in Scottish Schools research, which we'll publish in November. Annie Wells. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for answer and I welcome the fact that the first part of the summit has been held. However, this should have happened before the Scottish schools returned, um, after, uh, before the Scottish schools returned. Uh, during the debate that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, the Scottish Conservatives also called for an action plan to tackle violence and disruption ready for the start of the new school year, a new standard reporting system, a plan to address increasing issues with attendance and new guidance for school staff. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what work has been undertaken on these other key issues? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for her question. She raises a number of important points. Now, first of all, reiterate the debate was held in May. I then convened a head teachers task force in June. The member will be aware that teachers are usually on holiday in July and August. So therefore, the earliest possible opportunity for me to reconvene the summit was September, the first week back. We will be having further meetings in October and in November. I'm really keen to work on a cross-party basis on this issue, recognising the support I thought we heard across the Chamber back in May. She made a point in relation to attendance. This is an issue I've been addressing with Education Scotland directly. I receive fortnightly updates in relation to national attendance. There are real challenges, as she may have heard during the debate in May, in relation to current uh, certain year groups. So those year groups, for example, who were going through transition period during the pandemic are struggling, I think, with the return to formal education. There is more that we will need to do at a central government level to help support certain local authorities in tackling areas in relation to attendance. Um, and I do recognise that point. Um, I've also made clear that my priority is to use the summit process in its totality to identify solutions at school, local and national level to address the concerns that have been raised. We will use the insights that are provided through the summit process, but also that behaviour that thank comes you, from behaviour in Scottish schools research that will give us the accurate national picture uh, currently in relation thank to... Thank you. There is a lot of interesting supplementaries on this question, but the, the questions themselves will have to be very brief, as will the responses. First, Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, preventative action is crucial to tackle this issue, and I note £2 million was provided to support prevention activity in 2022-23. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what projects the Scottish Government are currently supporting to deliver this, please? Cabinet Secretary. And the Member is right to, to highlight this investment, and as she's outlined, the Government is providing over £2 million to support this really important preventative work, and that includes a range of programmes across portfolio areas, uh, including um, the education portfolio areas, but organisations such as the Education uh, Scotland Mentors in Violence Prevention Programme. That helps young people to become part of the solution through peer education and also taking a bystander approach, supporting them to positively influence attitudes and behaviours of their peers. The funding also enables Medics Against Violence to run a number of programmes, including its Youth Education Programme and Police Scotland's Youth Volunteers to deliver its programme to young people in Scotland's communities. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Providing Officer. Under this government, teachers are under more and more pressure. Classrooms are like pressure cookers. Class sizes have got bigger and teachers have been left wondering when the commitment to increase their non-contact time will be delivered. So does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that fulfilling the promise on non-contact time is essential to addressing the environment in the classroom, poor behaviour and violence in schools? Cabinet Secretary. I have to say, Presiding Officer, the member paints a fairly depressing picture in relation to Scottish education. We have, of course, the lowest pupil-teacher ratio in Scotland, the highest pay for teachers in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. And I think it's important also to say that we have the highest spend per pupil than any other part of the United Kingdom. We're investing in our education system. I recognise the call from the member in relation to class contact. Of course, I wrote to the member on this very issue at the very end of term, and I would seek to give the member a more fulsome update in the coming weeks. Briefly, Willie Rennie. I think the Cabinet Secretary did well before the summer to build a consensus across the Parliament 
uh, on this issue. Um, it's why I can't understand why she's excluded members of the Scottish Parliament from attending uh, some of these summits. I want to hear unfiltered from teachers and professionals about the issues they face. I don't want to speak, I just want to listen so that we can make the right decisions in this Parliament. I want to be properly connected with teachers. So will the Cabinet Secretary think again about allowing parliamentary spokes? Cabinet Secretary. I think Mr Rennie has to recognise that in the, the course of this summit, teachers will speak very openly and there may be a reticence from them to do so if they think that that might be used for political end. And I think he un has to understand that reality. I'm more than happy, however, to meet with MSPs across the chamber on this issue. I'm more than happy to look again at how we can engage MSPs directly in this process. But we do need to be mindful that these are professionals working in our education system and they may not feel comfortable speaking out in front of a group of politicians if they fear that may be used in other ways, for example, in this chamber. I've been very careful in building relationships working across the education system across uh, the last couple of months. And it's really important we build trust, I think, with the profession on this issue. But I will explore with my officials how we might be able to engage MSPs more directly in this work, recognising the sensitivities of those who work in our classrooms. Uh, question two, Paul Kane. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish updated details of its learning estate investment programme. Cabinet Secretary. Understand that local authorities are keen to get clarity on phase three of the learning estate investment programme. We wrote to local authorities to explain that consideration of potential phase three projects was still ongoing. It is important to recognise that we are trying to make these important investment decisions against a backdrop of market volatility on current projects. The need to keep Scottish finances on a sustainable trajectory and, as the uh, Chamber will be aware more recently, rack prevalence in school buildings. These are really big decisions. It's important we get them right and I hope to announce successful projects as soon as possible. Paul uh, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It does feel a little like Groundhog Day each time we get an answer to this question. It's a year now since the East Renfrewshire Council bid for two projects for Carrollside and Cross Athlete Primary School replacements. So the schools are badly needed uh, for the communities that they serve. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that issues and uncertainty around financing is causing real concern in local authorities who are trying to undertake long-term capital revenue planning. I appreciate that Highland colleagues will raise the issue specific to those communities, but does she fear, as communities do, that councils may have to shelve other projects due to the uncertainty from the government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'd have to say to the member, the uncertainty has been caused not by this government, but by a government elsewhere, as he well knows. And the decisions that have been taken by that government are impacting on our capital and our ability, rather, to spend in terms of capital in Scotland. He must take cognizance of that. Indeed, that was raised um, only at FMQ's uh, very, very recently, presiding officer, earlier today. But I do think the issue more broadly around about uncertainty is important. I am very keen to go to local authorities as soon as possible with an update on this issue. He will recognise that in the interim, we have faced real challenges in relation to the decision from the Department for Education surrounding RAC and schools in England. That has meant that we now need to take a a RAC approach to how we administer the LEAP fund and we are looking at how we might be able to support local authorities to that end. We are very clear that we expect the Treasury to make further funds available across the UK to deal with problems caused by RAC across the public sector estate. I know the DFM has written to the Treasury on uh, this issue. We haven't yet received a response. I've written to the Education Secretary in England on three occasions. We have yet to receive a response. I'm Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We've got a lot of interest. I'm going to move to supplementaries. First, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. The SNP government has a strong track record in improving the school estate. However, there are still significant challenges that teachers, staff and students face in schools, such as Bucky High in my constituency. Could the Cabinet Secretary advise when we would expect to hear an announcement on the LEAP 3 funding, funding which would build on that track record and which could provide real support to the challenges mentioned? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank the member for her question. I think, as I alluded to in my response to Mr O'Kane, I would hope to be in a position to, to do so as soon as possible. I, I think the other thing to remember is that the school estate does not actually belong to the Scottish Government. It belongs to our local authorities who have the statutory responsibility for the provision of education at local level. Notwithstanding, the Scottish Government has contributed to significant improvements across our school estates since 2007. I am uh, absolutely committed to working with our local authority partners on how we can go further, recognising the very real financial constraints that the Government is currently under. William Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, Kirsty Flanagan of SIPFA told the Education Committee that even when the delayed funds are finally announced, 
Local authorities will have to assess whether in the current financial climate they'll be able to deliver on what they hoped to last September. So what is the government doing to assess the impact of, the, of its delayed funding announcements on local councils and schools? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we will continue to work with local authority partners in re recognition of the financial challenges they face at the current time. But I think, as Mr Kerr will be aware, the economic, uh, disastrous economic uh, mismanagement by the UK government and the subsequent huge rise in inflation from Liz Truss's mini-budget has had a real impact on the projects that have already been chosen in previous phases of LEAP. And I would just like to remind the Chamber that it was, of course, this disastrous mini-budget that Tory MSPs urged this government to follow. We are currently giving very careful consideration to local authorities' bids for phase three of the Learning and Statement Investment Programme. And I do, as I have out outlined already today, Presiding Officer, intend to update Parliament on this as soon as possible, recognising the concerns from local authorities. And very briefly, John Swinney. Uh, President Officer, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary believes that in considering this question, Parliament has to be mindful of the fact that when this government came to office, our predecessors judged that it was acceptable for 63% of schools to be in good or satisfactory condition, but we now find ourselves, despite austerity, despite all the public spending constraints, that in excess of 90% of Scottish schools are now in good or satisfactory condition. Does that not need to be recalled as we consider this important question? As briefly as possible, Cabinet. I think Mr Swinney is absolutely correct to point out the significant investment from this government. And it's also important to remind the Chamber that there are a total of 34 ongoing Scottish uh, PFI contracts and the total remaining payments on those contracts awarded for all school PFI contracts is £7.45 yes, billion. Pounds. So the economic mismanagement by the previous administration is still costing this government in addition to that additionality, which of course we will be required to find now in terms of our investment and our continued support for investing in improving our school estate. Thank you. Question three, Stuart McMill. Thank you, Trainer. Also to ask the Scottish Government how it supports children with, within the education system that have learning disabilities, autism or neurodiversity. Cabinet Secretary. We want all children and young people to get the support that they need to reach their full learning potential, including those with learning disabilities and neurodiverse children and young people. The additional support for learning legislation very clearly places education authorities under duties to identify provide for and review the support needs for their pupils. We have developed a range of professional learning resources for school staff to better identify and support neurodiverse children and young people, for example, the Autism Toolbox and the Addressing Dyslexia Toolkit. Sure, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and I welcome the proposals for the new Learning Disability, Autism and Neurodiversity Bill, but note it's important that the process of shaping it is also accessible for the community's concerns. What work has the Scottish Government undertaken to ensure that accessible engagement processes are in place and to ensure that lived experiences are both prioritised and also heard? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think Stuart McMillan is absolutely correct. That's why we're taking, of course, a, a human rights based approach to ensure the bill is fully co designed with people with lived experience. We've also established three bill panels to support the development of consultation proposals, including a lived experience advisory panel. That panel advises on areas where change could have the greatest impact. We'll also ensure that meetings and papers are accessible, including preparing easy-read versions of all meeting papers and providing bespoke support to panel members with a learning disability. And we will work with the panel and stakeholders to co-design a consultation process that is as accessible and as inclusive as possible. Briefly, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Dyslexia is a condition that a significant number of our ASN-identified pupils suffer from. This Parliament has not had a debate in government time on dyslexia since very early on in its existence. Indeed, the last debate was a members' debate in session five. Could we have a government debate in their time on ASN provision so that I can raise the cases regarding dyslexia? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for his question. I think he raises a hugely important matter. Of course, we now have over a third of our young people uh, mainstream who have an additional support need. Um, I will speak to um, our Minister for Parliamentary Business around about how we might be able to secure some government time to debate this hugely important topic, which is crucial and fundamental, actually, to the inclusive education system we have in Scotland. Question four, Co-Cap Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any assessment and marking backlogs at universities. Minister Graham Day. Uh, Presiding Officer, following consultation with its membership, uh, UCU has withdrawn its marking and assessment boycott at universities across the UK, effective from the 6th of September, which is, of course, welcome. Now that the boycott has ended, universities are working to complete any outstanding marking and assessments so that affected students can get their final awards and degree classifications. So, you know, sir, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank students for the resilience during what has been clearly a difficult period and extend those thanks to all across the sector who have and who continue to work hard to minimise the impact on students. Cook up, Stuart. 
Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. My constituent, Claire Shanky, has been issued with a letter from the University of Edinburgh that only confirms that she has completed her degree. This did not include grading or a timescale of the final award. Like so many others, her life has been put on hold and she can't plan for her future. Does the Minister agree with me that this is a distressing situation for students whose entire experience has been impacted by COVID and then strike action? And what assurances can he provide that this situation can be resolved? Minister. Sir, can I empathise entirely with students like, who, like Claire, have been affected first by COVID and then industrial action and who deserve to receive the rewards of their hard work? I know that the impact of the marking assessment boycott has varied across and indeed within institutions. Now that the boycott has been withdrawn, it's my expectation that universities in Scotland with backlogs will work at pace to complete any outstanding marking and assessments in order to provide effective students with their final awards and degree classifications. I received a letter from the member just yesterday. I have asked my officials to pick up on this and I will write to her on Edinburgh's progress with the marking backlog as soon as we have that information to hand. Thank you. Question five, Kate Forbes to ask the Scottish Government how it is working with Highland Council to improve the school estate in the Skyle Harbour and Badenoch constituency. Cabinet Secretary. The £2 billion learning estate investment programme is being delivered in partnership with local authorities and will benefit tens of thousands of pupils across Scotland. Through phase two of the learning estate investment programme, we announced that Highland Council's Broadford Primary School project, which is in the member Skyle Harbour and Badenoch constituency, would receive Scottish Government funding to support. The school will deliver both Gaelic and English, uh, Gaelic medium rather, education and English education, as well as the community facilities for Broadford. It is being designed to pacify standard and construction is due to start next summer. Kate Ford. The Minister of uh, the Cabinet Secretary sorry, makes clear that Highland Council is responsible for the school estate. They have applied for funding to replace additional support needs school St Clements uh, and also two other primary schools, Dunvegan Primary School and Bewley. All of them are in a dire state of disrepair. Will the Scottish Government be able to advise the Council whether they have been successful or not for Leap 3 funding? Cabinet Secretary. I very much recognise the members' interests uh, in relation to LEAP Phase 3 funding. We've heard other members raise this issue today, Presiding Officer, and I'm keen to update Parliament as soon as possible on this matter. Um, as I've outlined, we have written to local authorities to explain the consideration for Phase 3 projects is still ongoing. And it is important to recognise we are trying to make these really important investment decisions against that backdrop of market volatility on current projects that need to keep Scottish finances on a sustainable trajectory and the additional challenge in relation to RAC in school buildings. However, I recognise uh, the member's interest in relation to her own constituency. I know there will be other members across the Parliament who have similar interests. I would seek to provide Parliament with an update as soon as possible, recognising the financial challenge at the current time. And briefly, Jamie Harker Johnson. You are now left with the um, unsuitable, potentially unhealthy buildings, which will only be made habitable and not replaced with the new school buildings that are so desperately needed. So while this make, do and mend approach from SNP ministers in Edinburgh and SNP Highland Council in Inverness continues, when can teachers, parents and children in Dunvegan, Bewley and other parts of the Highlands expect to see the new schools they were promised? Cabinet Secretary. I have to say, I think as we've heard from Mr Swinney, when the SNP first came to government, about 60% of our schools were in good or satisfactory condition. Presiding officer, today that's over 91%. I think that's a good record of investment from this I government in our school estate, particularly when the responsibility for our school buildings not, does not rest with this government, but rests with local authorities. Now, I have... I have committed to Parliament today to provide an update in relation to the LEAP 3 projects and I hope the member will welcome that and welcome the significant investment that has come from this government in improving our school estate. Question 6, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what opportunities the development of a Scottish education exchange programme would present for young people in Kilmarnock and Urban Valley. Minister Graham. And also, we are committed to addressing one of the most damaging consequences of Brexit for our young people, namely the fact they cannot access the Erasmus Plus programme. This year we are set up a test and learn project to re-establish some of those opportunities. In 2024-25 we will build on that initial project to develop a programme which can provide opportunities for young people, including those in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley, which prioritises placements for disadvantaged groups and further de uh, demonstrates our commitment to EU and global partnerships with schools, colleges and universities throughout Scotland. Willie Coffey. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Knowledge Education Exchange Programme forms a core part of our commitment to engaging with EU further learning institutions. Does the Minister agree with me, however, that the best way, the only way for Scotland's young people to fully receive the benefits of EU further education 
is to rejoin the European Union rather than continue to reject it as Scottish Labour, the Tories and the Lib Dems are doing. Minister. Uh, the member is absolutely right, of course. The hard Brexit supported by both Labour and the Tories has robbed young people in Scotland of some of the opportunities that previous generations were able to benefit from, including Erasmus. That's why we are committed to the Education Exchange Programme, which re-establishes some of the opportunities Erasmus provided, but the UK's replacement touring scheme does not. And we are designing it in partnership with universities and colleges who have real expertise to offer. But rather than picking up the pieces of Brexit, wouldn't it be much simpler, President Officer, for Scotland to play a full, positive and constructive role with our neighbours in Europe by rejoining the EU as an independent country? Question 7, Claire Adamson. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve digital education in light of the increased prominence of artificial intelligence and cyber technology. Cabinet Secretary. I am acutely aware of recent developments in artificial intelligence and cyber technology and in that context the provision of high quality digital education has never been more important. In the programme for government we have committed to developing a new digital strategy to help ensure digital provision supports the wider aims of the education system. The £13 million allocated in the 23-24 budget is a first step in delivering improvements in digital provision. Claire Adamson. Thank the Minister for her answer. This year, we, I was privileged to visit the National Robotarium at Heriot Watt University. Last week, I attended the opening of the Centre for Data Science and AI at the ARC at the University of Glasgow. And this week, I've hosted census in the Parliament. Um, the ambitions for Scottish di Scotland's digital AI and robotic sectors at these centres is inspirational. What is the Scottish Government doing to foster a direct engagement between schools and STEM centres of excellence to encourage diversity and interest in STEM careers? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member raises a really important um, point and she's outlined some uh, examples of positive uh, good working and I heard recently about the robotics centre actually from Liam Kerr who I understand visited the centre earlier this week and there is certainly more that we would want to do in relation to joining that opportunity with educational opportunities in school. That engagement with employers and others to challenge existing inequalities particularly in relation to access is a theme of the STEM education and training strategy. There are 20 employer-led developing the young workforce regional groups which are very well placed to make these connections as part of our wider ambition to create a highly skilled and competitive workforce in the future. Supplementary first, Megan Gunner. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP government has failed to provide digital inclusion funding since 2020-2021. So as this SNP government cuts council budgets year on year, how does the Cabinet Secretary expect local authorities to improve digital education without any support? Cabinet Secretary. During the pandemic, we provided £25 million to local authorities, which supported the purchase of over 72,000 devices and 14,000 internet connections for school children across Scotland. As I intimated in my response, I think, to Claire Adamson, we will be bringing forward a digital strategy which will work with local authorities, many of whom actually have really practical challenges in relation to connectivity within their school estate, which looks different in different local authorities and looks different in different schools. I hope the member would recognise that. But the important point to remember is that we have a generation of young people going through our education system who require to be upskilled digitally. That is why we made the laptop and the uh, commitment in relation to digital devices. That is why we are bringing forward a digital strategy that will help these young people in relation to their learning in school, but also help to improve their learning and understanding as they move into the world of work and further education. Very briefly, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. In 2022, the number of people entering computing teaching training was half the target set by this government. The STEM bursary scheme has clearly not succeeded in incentivising a career in computing teaching. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that unless the government tackles the chronic shortage of computing teachers, people will rightly question how serious they are about improving digital education in our schools? Cabinet Secretary. Well, our new teacher uh, bursary scheme actually provides bursaries of £20,000 for career changers wishing to undertake a one-year PGDE in hard-to-fill STEM subjects, so physics, math, technical education, including computing science, I must say. There are also national incentives in place to encourage teachers to locate to more remote, remote areas. So, for example, through the preference waiver payment, probationary teachers can receive up to £8,000 if they're willing to complete their probation anywhere in Scotland. I know because I undertook that myself many years ago now. But I do think the member's right to raise the challenge around about certain subject areas. These are matters that I raised very recently with the Strategic Board for Teacher Education in relation to how we can make sure that we have a teaching population which meets the needs of our young people. And I've committed to work with the Strategic Board on that matter and I would seek to update Parliament later this year in relation to that work. Question 8, Ros McCall. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the National Allowance for Foster and Kinship Care. Minister Natalie Dole. Presiding Officer, following discussions between the Scottish Government and COSLA, it has been agreed that the Scottish Government will provide an additional £16 million of revenue to introduce a new Scottish recommended allowance for foster and kinship carers across Scotland, benefiting over 9,000 families. The Scottish recommended allowance will ensure that a consistent and transparent level of financial support is provided to all foster and kinship carers, helping them to provide the standard of living and well-being that the children and young people in their care deserve. This is another important step in our ambition to keep the promise and ensure all care experienced children and young people grow up loved, safe and respected. Ross McCall. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Minister and I really strongly welcome the news which was first promised in 2016. The new national allowance will make a significant difference to the daily lives of some of the most vulnerable children and young people in Scotland. I thank the Minister also for writing to me on the 8th of September stating that the £16 million has been found from the Children's and Families Dictorate to fund the policy. Excuse me. Given that we're consistently told in order to spend money, we need to explain where it will be cut. Can the Minister tell me what the Scottish Government has cut to fund the policy? Minister. I'm sure the member will be aware of the complexities around budget and it's not quite as clear cut as that. If the member would like more information on this, I'm happy to get back to her at a later date. Very briefly, Colette Stevenson. It, the National Alliance has been a significant step in Scotland's journey towards achieving the promise. Reflecting on the promise implementation plan, what routes is the Scottish Government undertaking to ensure it is met? Again, as briefly as possible, Minister. Thank uh, Ms Stevenson for that question. So we are working with stakeholders across Scotland to ensure that we are driving forward the change that the promise demands. And to give just a few examples, we have set out our support for families through our Whole Family Wellbeing Fund. The Children's Care and Justice Bill is presently going through Parliament. And we are collaborating with care experienced young people and adults on the support they need as they move on from care settings. Keeping the promise requires a cross-portfolio and cross-policy response. And the work that we are doing is threaded through our recent programme for government. To guide this work, we are also creating a dedicated Promise Subcommittee, which will link the cross-portfolio commitments and, and interdependencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions and education and skills. There will be a brief pause um, before we move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.